Scientist who discovered GMOs cause tumors in rats wins landmark defamation lawsuit in Paris, November 30th, 2015. Was French professor Gilles-Éric Serralini correct when he discovered that scientific feeding experiments past 90 days with GMO foods in rats can cause serious health problems, including tumors? The answer to that question has been debated ever since the initial publication of his study, culminating in a republication of the study in another peer-reviewed journal that wasn't nearly as well covered as the initial retraction was by the mainstream media. Now, Professor Serralini is in the news again, this time for winning a major court victory in a libel trial that represents the second court victory for Serralini and his team in less than a month. All right, what on earth is this all about? For those who are joining this story in medias res, this is Professor Gilles-Éric Serralini, who published a landmark feeding study uh, regarding GMO corn and Roundup Ready herbicide in 2012 in a article in the Journal of Food and Chemical Toxicology. Now, the details of that study and how it came to be retracted are in this video, this eye-opener report that I did in December of 2013 called Genetic Fallacy, How Monsanto Silences Scientific Dissent. Of course, this is going to be linked up in the show notes. Please go and watch this video if you don't know about this trial uh, or about this study and then its subsequent retraction and why that uh, retraction is, well, was bogus. Uh, this is a very important report, and I'm not just blowing my own horn here. Uh, this is a report that actually won a Project Censored Award last year. I never really mentioned that, so you might not know it, but yes, this is, I think, one of my most important reports on this subject. So I hope you will go and take a look. Of course, the uh, the transcript of this is also up on my website under uh, Genetic Fallacy. So let's just read a little bit about this study, Long-Term Toxicity of a Roundup Herbicide and a Roundup Tolerant Genetically Modified Maze. The researchers followed 200 rats over two years, divided into 10 groups each of 10 males and 10 females. Three of the groups were fed Monsanto's patented NK603 GMO corn alone, Three groups were fed the corn treated with Roundup herbicide, three groups were fed Roundup treated water but no GMO corn, and a control group was fed neither GMO corn nor Roundup herbicide. The team's results indicated that the rats fed the Roundup or the GMO corn, separately or combined, were more likely to experience a range of ill health effects than the non-GMO control group. Tellingly, the adverse health effects did not start to appear until the fourth month of the study, while a previous industry-sponsored feeding trial on the same corn variety only lasted three months. That study did find signs of toxicity as well, but these results were dismissed as not biologically meaningful. All right, I'll let you continue reading about uh, how ultimately this story, this study came under immediate fire from the usual suspects in the industry-funded uh, lobby groups, and ultimately the Journal of Food and Chemical Toxicology retracted the study, but not retracted it based on its own uh, published guidelines for uh, its principles for re retraction, i.e. clear evidence that the findings are unreliable due to misconduct or error, plagiarism or redundant publication or unethical research. No, none of those. They came up with a new criteria. Mainly, they found that uh, no evidence of fraud or intentional misrepresentation of the data, and the results presented were correct, were not incorrect, but were inconclusive. So on the basis of inconclusiveness, they retracted that study, which again is a double standard, as I go on to note, that is only applicable apparently to critics of the GMO industry in general and Monsanto products in particular. And there's a specific part of that uh, accusation in regards to this. Again, in that video, Genetic Fallacy, I play a clip of Dr. E. Ann Clark talking about how uh, the journal in question that retracted this study happened to uh, appoint a uh, Monsanto uh, a lobbyist on their board uh, during the time of the, the retraction. So, again, uh, so much to this, but, but ultimately this goes back to the question of whether or not the science itself was uh, acceptable. And basically, critics of the study argue, well, those those rats are prone to those types of tumors, so they're not good for this type of study, and blah, blah, blah. But this still represents fundamentally a double standard used in evaluating GMO safety studies. And the GMO pro-GMO industry can get away with inconclusive studies uh, as long as they are on the GMO uh, industry side. But as soon as an independent scientist tries to do the exact same type of study, the exact same setup... Well, if they don't if have uh, results that are the same as the GMO-funded studies, they get on uh, they get retracted like Seralini. So, this this uh, story comes from InSignCensorship.org. 
which says, an example of an inconclusive study that has not been retracted from FCT, the Food and Chemical Toxicology Journal, is the Monsanto study on the same GM maize variety that Seralini tested. This study used the same strain of rat and analyzed blood and urine samples from the same number of animals as Seralini used in total. Crucially, however, the Monsanto study was only 90 days in duration. Thus, it was terminated a month before the more obvious pathologies began to appear in the Seralini study. Nevertheless, the data in the Monsanto study show statistically significant differences in multiple organ functions between the GM and non-GM feeding groups, which the Monsanto authors dismissed as not biologically meaningful without proper scientific justification. As a result, and of great importance from a public health perspective, this GM maze was passed by regulators as safe to consume on a lifelong basis, despite the fact that the Monsanto study was only 90 days in duration and contained scientifically questionable claims of statistically significant findings being termed as not biologically meaningful. In fact, the Monsanto data as presented are inconclusive. Applying the same criteria to the Monsanto study as were used to evaluate and retract the Seralini study, the Monsanto paper should also be retracted, as it was too inconclusive, as it too was inconclusive in its findings. Again, I mean, just blatant double standards going on, and I'll let you read through all of that. But the point of all of this is that although the Food and Chemical Toxicology Journal did retract the study, it was republished in another peer-reviewed uh, journal, this time the Environmental Sciences Europe uh, Journal. So, the, again, this was republished with uh, a, addended, uh, an addendum of comments uh, regarding the criticisms of the first study. So that is there. It's an open access journal, so you can access this freely and read through it yourself. And I suggest you do so. But as this uh, article pointed out, somehow, for some reason, the republication of this study in the peer-reviewed uh, literature did not seem to get any traction in the mainstream media, although the initial retraction of this study got a lot of attention in the MSM. Oh, look, this crazy GMO, anti-GMO scientist with his vendetta against GMOs, his study has been retracted for bad science. Well, of course, again, when you look into it, it's a ridiculous claim, and then it was republished anyway, but you never heard about that. Well, now he has won a couple of uh, court cases on this. Uh, the first one... Uh, that they note here in this article, on November 25th, the High Court in Paris indicted Mark Fallus, the former chairman of France's Biomolecular Energy Commission, for forgery and use of forgery. And according to Seralini, this relates to the signature of a scientist whose name was used without his ar agreement to argue that Seralini and his co-workers were wrong in their studies on Monsanto products, including GM corn. So basically, this uh, this Biomolecular Engineering Commission chair for France uh, slandered Seralini um, using a forged name of a scientist. He is expected to be sentenced for that in a crime in June of 2016. And this is the second uh, court case that Seralini has won in the last month. Uh, the other one, you can find details here. Seralini's team wins defamation forgery court cases on GMO and pesticide research. It notes that in September 2012, an article written by Jean-Claude Jayet in Marianne magazine said that researchers around the world had voiced harsh words about the research of Seralini and his team on the toxic effects of a GMO and Roundup over a long-term period, research that was supported by the independent organization Cregen. The journalist wrote of a scientific fraud in which the methodology served, served to reinforce predetermined results. But Seralini and his team uh, and Cregen challenged this uh, allegation in a defamation lawsuit. They were assisted by notaries, blah, blah, blah. On 6th of November 2015, after a criminal investigation lasting three years, the 17th criminal cha chamber of the High Court of Paris passed sentence. Marianne Magazine and its journalist were fined for public defamation of a public official and public defamation of the researchers and of Cregen. So... Some uh, court successes going on here, uh, defending Seralini and his, his name and reputation, but perhaps too little too late, because in the minds of many uh, who heard anything at all about this uh, study, they probably only heard that it was retracted and thus not really that important. Well, that is a lie. Uh, it is being shown and demonstrated to be a lie, but not in the MSM that, of course, is not going to publish things that are uh, in in opposition to their... Uh, cushy advertising dollars from their Monsanto clients. No, it's up to us 
to continue to get the word out about this. So there's lots of information here that, I, again, I'll put in the show notes. Please do start with this genetic fallacy video and work your way out from there. And if you know about all this information, excellent. But as always, I guarantee you there are people in your life who do not. And if you bring up something like this uh, feeding study showing these tumors in these rats, you're probably going to be uh, confronted with people saying, oh, that study was retracted. Well, you can uh, use this information to show those naysayers in your life why they are wrong and hopefully we can continue to learn our way forward in all of this uh, again this is an exceptionally important uh, story and it goes to the heart of the types of scientific frauds that are perpetrated with the aid of various uh, organizations that don't want the truth coming out we are here to help that truth get out so you are part of that fight please help spread this information james corbett corbettreport.com Hello, Internet! Today, we're going to talk about the herbicide glyphosate. Glyphosate is the most commonly used herbicide in the United States, with over 200 million pounds used annually. And what does this chemical do? Well, it kills weeds. Glyphosate is an enzyme inhibitor. It stops the activity of the enzyme 5 enyl pyruval shikimate 3 phosphate synthase from doing its job, which is to assist in the production of three essential amino acids, tyrosine, tryptophan, and phenylalanine. There are 22 amino acids that all creatures need to survive. Not having three means <coughs> death. But it's important to remember that humans and other animals don't actually make any 5 enyl pyruval shikimate 3 phosphate synthase themselves. We've got mouths instead. We eat creatures, plants, who make these fancy molecules themselves so that we don't have to do it. So. If we don't have any copies of this enzyme, then glyphosate shouldn't do us any damage, right? Sort of. Glyphosate was developed in 1970 by a company called Monsanto. For the last 45 years, they've been marketing it under the name of Roundup. However, Roundup didn't actually reach absurdly high levels of use until genetic modification technology became available in the 1990s. Monsanto developed Roundup Ready Soy in 1994 and Roundup Ready Corn in 1996. These crops both contain an alternative version of the enzyme 5 enyl pyruval shikimate 3 phosphate synthase that's derived from bacteria and is not inhibited by glyphosate. Today, about 90% of the soybeans and 70% of the corn grown in the United States is Roundup ready. All right, let's pause here for a second because it's about to get pretty complicated. There are four, count them, four hot button issues which make talking about this chemical extremely difficult because somebody is bound to get angry at you. And they should get angry because a lot of this stuff is really, really messed up. So here's the deal. Some people are upset about genetic modification. Other people are worried about the toxicity of herbicides and pesticides. Other people are worried about the ecological effects of gigantic monocultures. And still other people are worried that our agricultural system has fallen under the sway of gigantic multinational corporations like Monsanto. These problems are all intertwined, but they have very distinct solutions. Unfortunately, the public debate surrounding these issues tends to look like this. GMOs are bad! GMOs are bad! GMOs are really, 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 really bad! That might be true, but let's try to figure out why, okay? Let's look at each one of these four issues individually. Issue number one. Is Monsanto bad? Absolutely, unequivocally, yes. They're terrible. Most of Monsanto's terribleness comes from the revolving door connecting lobbyists with politicians and the way that both of those groups use their influence to create unjust intellectual property law which hurts farmers. Monsanto is famous for prosecuting farmers who try to save Monsanto seed for another season or hybridize it with their local varieties. In general, Monsanto policies hurt small farmers and incentivize large monocultures with a heavy reliance on chemicals like glyphosate. However, it's important to remember that Monsanto, as a corporation, is distinct from the idea of monoculture, or of chemical use, or even of genetic modification. Monsanto is terrible for political reasons, and it's possible that those other ideas associated with it could be applied sustainably in a different context. <laughs> Except for monoculture. Monoculture is just really, really, really terrible. Issue number two. Is monoculture bad? The problem 
with monoculture is that it optimizes land use for machines at the expense of things like biodiversity and human accessibility and even yield. Even yield. Yields could be much higher if we planted different species of plants together to take advantage of different growth patterns and heights and seasons and things like that. That's what we used to do. But the problem with that is that it's very difficult to build a machine that can harvest one kind of plant while leaving another one intact. And so we have millions of acres occupied by a loose grid of one kind of creature. This keeps prices low. However, it also keeps pest populations unusually high, and so this kind of farming requires a lot of pesticides. A lot. Does that mean that agricultural chemicals are terrible too? Issue number three. Are agricultural chemicals bad? Actually, no. Not if they're used outside of a monocultural context. Let's go back to glyphosate. A lot of the concerns associated with Roundup aren't about the toxicity of the chemical itself, but about its indirect ecological effects. For example, glyphosate runoff has been shown to be particularly destructive towards aquatic ecosystems. But the only way that Roundup could ever reach those aquatic ecosystems when it's supposed to be applied just to crops is when it's being applied massively and repeatedly over a huge area. Monoculture applications. If you're just applying Roundup to your backyard garden for a pesky weed, it's not going to do that much harm. If we use chemicals infrequently for a specific pest in a localized area, we can protect our crops without bulldozing the surrounding environment. The goal is to use chemicals that are ecologically specific. Oddly enough, this is the promise of genetic modification. Issue number four. Is genetic modification bad? Let's think about what's been done to these Roundup Ready plants. They've been given an alternative copy of 5-enol pyruval shikimate 3-phosphate synthase, a copy that is not inhibited by glyphosate. Glyphosate can then be applied directly to these plants, and it will leave them alone, even while it eliminates the more harmful weeds directly next door. This could be an incredibly specific kind of chemical control if it were used properly. It often isn't. Take another GM crop, BT corn. BT corn has been modified to produce a bacterial toxin which is toxic to caterpillars. It is not, however, toxic to beetles or grasshoppers or even humans. BT toxin is produced inside the tissues of the plants, and so there's no risk of it leaching into the environment as it would if the pesticide were applied willy-nilly all over the place. Basically, genetic modification has the potential of producing highly specific, ecologically sensitive methods to control pests. Unfortunately, the way we've been using genetic modification has served to increase, not decrease, our ecological footprint. However, that has more to do with the particular politics of Monsanto and the particular economic conditions that support monoculture, and not anything inherent in the genetic modification process itself, or even with the nature of pesticides. Here is why I get so frustrated with the GMO debate. The fact of the matter is, GMOs are not inherently evil. They're certainly not going to give you cancer, although there are plenty of articles that will tell you otherwise. The same is true for many kinds of pesticide. The problem with these technologies is not inherent, but rather that their development and use is controlled by terrible corporations who use their power to expand a monocultural food system which is destroying the planet. This doesn't have to be the case. In fact, there is a very simple solution that you can do right now which doesn't involve changing a single law. Are you ready? Here it is. Start growing your own food. That's it. I assume you have access to a windowsill. Put a plant on it, seriously. It's that simple. The problem with our agricultural system isn't the toxicity of GMOs or agricultural chemicals. The problem is that we have given away our ability to produce the food which sustains us. It's time to take that ability back. So put a plant on your windowsill! Seriously, you don't even need seeds! The next time you cook carrots, just take the ends and put them in some dirt! It will grow, I promise! These are the radishes, the celery, the beets, basil, parsley, carrot tops, from bits of carrot that I planted, bok choy, leeks. All the food in this garden is grown from things that most people consider to be garbage. And then, if you're feeling ambitious, plant a little garden! Hell, spray it with some pesticides if the pests get really bad one year! The point is that any food that you you grow yourself, keeps money in your pocket, and out of the coffers of companies like Monsanto. That's it. That's the end of the video. Go! Grow your own food! The food system can feel impossibly complicated and broken beyond repair. But then there's the simple act of taking care of another living creature 
and pulling your nourishment directly out of the dirt that can immediately reconnect you with what food is supposed to feel like. Only after we experience this original agricultural process can we hope to make informed decisions about pesticides or genetic engineering or agricultural economics. So go plant something. Seriously, right now, go do it. Go get a pot and fill it with some dirt. Video's done. <laughs> That's it. Hit the little X and then go outside and, and fill a pot with dirt and put a plant in it. It'll make you really happy, I promise. I, I really promise it'll make you happy. And then in like a month or so, you'll have food to eat and then that'll make you really happy. And it's just, it's a really good thing to do. So uh, yeah, plant some plants.